the biggest concern in marriage is trying to get the parents' approval of a spouse who's from a different race. I mean, everything, all hell will break loose if a person goes up to his mom or dad trying to deduce his fiance or someone that he likes to his parents and they're from a different race. I mean, I've heard of cases where men have or guys go up to their parents and try to tell their mom and dad about the one he likes to get married to is from a different country, not a different race, from a different country. And the parents still disapprove of that. I mean, growing up in the West, we get to interact with people from different races, different countries, and that's a good thing to bring and to create more interracial marriages and to break the racial boundaries. But yet we still find our friends, sometimes ourselves, not able to get married to a, maybe a Pakistani because someone is Iraqi, not be able to marry a Lebanese because the guy is Iraqi or the guy is Pakistani, and such issues. I mean, even some parts of the world where I've seen, you can't get married to someone, to a girl or a guy who's from a different city. And what's even worse, you can't get married to someone from a different tribe. I mean, I thought racism died decades back, yet here we are again, trying to find out why people around the world still have a negative view about interracial marriage. Joining me live from the holy city of Karbala once again, Dr. Sayyid Ammar Naqshawani to dissect this issue of interracial marriage. Sayyidina, as alaykum. Wa alaykum as How are you doing? Allah, very well. Allah khalikum, inshaAllah. I mean, uh, we got a lot of comments before we dive into uh, this topic. We got a lot of comments and questions. How did you spend your Christmas? Just very quickly. Well, I'm in the, you know, in the holy land of uh, Najaf and then the holy land of Karbala now. So uh, where better to spend than, you know, in the cities of the saints who describe Christ better than most could. So Alhamdulillah, mm -hmm. Alhamdulillah. God has blessed us. Alhamdulillah. Uh, now, Sayyidina, a lot of people um, wonder, in Islam, is marriage mandatory? Is it, uh, is it recommended, obligatory? Um, and who do we blame when uh, the parents pick on stuff that are really minor in a marriage? Not looking at their religion, uh, not looking at any, anything else, but maybe looking at the color of their skin um, and something else. I mean, how, how do you address that? Well, marriage and the religion of Islam, if you read a lot of the literature regarding marriage, you'll find mm -hmm. that it is so highly recommended that it's virtually seen as being obligatory and in some cases becomes obligatory if someone knows that by not being married that they, they are going to disobey their Lord, mm -hmm. that by not being married they're going to go against the commands of their Lord, they're not going to be able to fulfill their spiritual potential. And so the Holy Prophet peace be upon his family would in many cases in the famous line that we recite in any Muslim wedding when the Imam comes to recite the lines of marriage of the traditions of the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him and his family, that he'll always stress on is when the Prophet, peace be upon him and his family, said that marriage is from my teachings, from my traditions. Mm -hmm. And whoever stays away from such a tradition is mm -hmm. not from me. Mm -hmm. So you find, therefore, that many of the scholars say that one of the highest recommended acts, that which fulfills half of your religion and gets you closer to the Lord, is, of course, marriage. Mm -hmm. But yes, you're absolutely right when you say that many of the youths today are put off from getting married and for many different reasons. In some cases, their expectations on them financially yeah. are incredible. That in some cases you'll find parents who themselves, when they got married, weren't the wealthiest in the world, are now assuming that the person who comes to propose for example for their daughter has to be has to be a millionaire has to be a millionaire and while looking out for someone's security especially your own family is fundamental yeah that does put off someone who's on the path of starting their career no one's really gonna start off their career on seven figures for example but if you could start off your life having that love of god having the love of the quran and the teachings of the Prophet peace be upon him and his family, then definitely that's somewhere to start. So some of the youth are put off because of this. Then what we find now in the demographic of Muslims is that in the last 40 odd years, or maybe even more, there are many Muslims who are living in the West. 
Yeah. Many came from different boats, who are now all on the same ship. In the past, the Pakistani only knew of Pakistanis. The Iraqi only knew of Iraqis. The Moroccan and the Egyptian only knew of Moroccans and Egyptians. The Lebanese, for example, knew of the Lebanese. But now, there is a lot more interaction in our centers, especially with the rise of English lectures. Yes. If the lectures were only in Arabic, then only the Arabs will understand and go yeah. to that center. Yeah. And if the lectures, for example, were only in Farsi, then only the Persians will go towards there. And if the lectures were only in Urdu, only then, the for example, the indo pak subcontinent. But now yeah. when you have the English lectures, you have this mixing. Thanks, Sayyid Amwar. Well, amongst <laughs> others. Uh, but I'd say, yeah, predominantly. And, and you know, when, when you see that I so love many when you do that. When you see so many who come towards these lectures, what's wonderful is that to your right, when you're praying in Salah, you'll have someone who, for example, may be of an Indo-Pak background. Yeah. To your left, a North African background. In front of you, you may have someone of a European reverb background. Someone behind you may be of a, for example, Black American African background. That means that, especially in Salat al and that means that what's going to happen is that this mixing which is taking place inevitably is going to lead us to going to each other's houses, being in the same schools as one another, and organizing programs in our mosques where there's going to be interaction between yourself and, the, for example, the sisters of the community. When yes. that happens, some of the brothers may want to marry a sister from a different background altogether. And sadly, we still have sometimes the seeds of prejudice, ignorance, even racism in some of our communities, where fathers who, because they were only raised in an environment where they only knew of their type and used to look at everyone else as the other yeah. rather than the brother or the sister, those fathers, when the son will come home and say that, for example, I've met a mu'mina, I've met a believing sister, or well, that girl, when she comes home to her father and says, I met a mu'min, a believing brother, and I'm interested in getting to know them for marriage, sadly, you still have cases where people are rejected simply because of their skin color, where people are rejected from marriage, not because of the fact that they are people far away from the teachings of God, mm -hmm. not because they are people who you cannot have security with your, mm -hmm. you know, your sibling, mm -hmm. for example, or your, you know, your, your relative for but rather simply because of the fact that they come from a culture or a race that's different to yours. Mm -hmm. When this happens, there is a need for us to introspectively look at ourselves and ask ourselves, is this what was envisaged when the religion of Islam first was established? Yes. Was the religion of Islam a religion that came for everybody or came only for the Arabs? We'll find out. And so what you find is that when it comes to our communities, there are youths who are put off marriage because they say that I wanted to marry someone who was a lover of God, a believer in the Quran, a follower of the teachings of the Ahlul Bayt But because I'm from Iraq and they are, for example, from India, or because I'm from Africa and they were, for example, from an American revert background, our parents did not let us because they said you will only marry from our own. Mm -hmm. When that begins to enter the Muslim community, we have to ask ourselves, is Jahiliyyah now returning or not? Remember, Jahiliyyah, which in ignorance is normally translated, uh, in, in English is normally translated as the period of ignorance, Jahiliyyah is not just one. It wasn't just Jahiliyyah in the time of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon his family, that the mm -hmm. Arabs were in a period of ignorance. In the Quran, you have the ayah, <laughs> So that means there's a thaniya, and a thalfa, and a rabah, and a khamsa. That means there's another jahiliya will come, and another, and another. We have to be careful that we aren't the people who have sowed the seeds for the return of jahiliya. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, Sayyidina, you mentioned something before we move on. Um, you know, if, if, if a mu'min, uh, you know, a girl goes up to her dad, oh, I met a mu'min, you don't see that happening because the, 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 the family is so um, conservative, if you will. They're, they're, they're so closed uh, that you don't really see a girl coming up to her dad or mom, you know, I've met a mu'min, let me go talk to him. And now she's telling him, oh, she's from a different race. I mean, how do we break that? Well, look at Very the, simply. Look at the Holy Quran. Uh, you'll find a prophet like Nabi Shu'aib is the one who goes towards Nabi Musa and says yeah. to him, قَالَ إِنِّي أُرِيدُ أَنْ أُنْكِحَكَ أَحْدَ بْنَتَيَّ هَاتَيْنِ 
that's a prophet though. But what is the prophet except an exemplar for us? Either we look at these stories as just, you know, just tales, or we apply their lessons. The Quran, notice, doesn't give you bits and pieces of details. Um, it gives you lessons. If you notice in the story of Ashab al-Kahf, God makes it clear, seven, eight, if you, some will ask, is it nine of them, is it six of them? You're not understanding the, the meaning of the story. It's not about asking how many were in the cave. Yeah. Likewise, in this story, it's not about saying, well, this is only a prophet of Allah. The most important thing is for a person to say, hold on, here's a prophet of God. His daughter has met Moses. He's taken the proposal. He's highlighting. It's not just the guy who has to bring the proposal home. It's the if the father feels, or if the daughter can have a relationship with her father that's open, then the father comes to Moses and says, I would be honored. If you'd marry one of my daughters. Wow. So, when the Holy Prophet, peace be upon his family, even tells us about the upbringing of children, first seven years, let them be free, second seven years, discipline them, third seven years, be their friend. From the age of 14 to the age of 21, you'll find that when these bodily changes are occurring, when a person begins to look at their future, what am I going to do? Who do I want to settle with? If I find the right person, the parents have to be friends at that time. Yeah. The parents can't give this impression that, you know what, if you want to marry someone, don't even think about it, we're choosing for you, you have no choice whatsoever. No, not at all. And what we're finding today is that many of the parents are trying to come to terms with the evolution of the Muslim community. Mm -hmm. Only 20, 30 years earlier, they would have only met people of their skin color, only yeah. met people of their village in some cases. Yeah. Whereas now, when they're meeting other cultures, at the beginning, what happens when you come to another culture, there's a bit of a insecurity because you don't know much about the other culture. But as a Muslim, religion overrides. Are they followers of the Quran? Are they followers of the Ahlul Bayt? If that's going to be the principles by which they look after our son or our daughter, that's enough. So we have to begin to reflect on the, on the, on the Quranic teachings that are telling us that there is no harm having that open discussion with one's siblings, one's children, openly and discussing that if you do want to get married to someone, then let us live by the principles of the Prophet, peace be upon him and his family. Mm -hmm. Now moving on, Sayyidina, um, that was nicely answered. Um, th there's something that occurs um, in different parts of the world. Um, celibacy. Is it an option in Islam for men and women? Can, you know, can men not get married, not have you know, uh, a relationship with, with a woman, or is this... Uh, uh, celibacy is, is uh, prohibited in Islam. Islam. Um, in Christianity, you'll find that many priests may have adopted the path of celibacy, say, mm -hmm. staying away from marriage. But they decided that one of the best ways in which they could build their relationships with God is by staying away from getting married. Mm -hmm. Islam looks at this with the term Rahbaniya. Yeah. It's a form of asceticism which they have innovated. This is not part of the teachings of the religion. This is not part of the ways in which you get to God. So why make it? Well, for some in the Christian world, they believe that Jesus did not get married and John the Baptist did not get married. But Jesus and John the Baptist were not around for 70 years on this earth. Christ was around at most to his early 30s. Some Muslims believed in early Islam that by staying away from women, by staying away from getting married, they'll have a lot more taqwa, a lot more consciousness of God's presence in their life. And this hurt the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, and his family. Because when some Muslims thought, okay, I'm not going to wear any fragrance because fragrance is a sign that you're a person of this world. And some Muslims believe that I will not eat meat because it's of the luxuries of this world. And some Muslims said that we will not get married because woman will take us away in the same way that Eve took Adam away. Sadly, this type of thought affected biblical literature. And so when this type of thought began to affect biblical literature, it also began to permeate into the nascent Muslim community. What then occurs is that the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon his time, makes it clear. If you're going to be extravagant in this world, it can only be on 
your fragrances and your perfumes. It's amazing how many times you may go to the Muslim world and have two extremes. You may have someone who smells unbelievable, like myself, for example. And even yourself, on your good days, you smell all right as well. Then oh you have, wow. for example, <laughs> those who, spread. when you're hugging them, what a rumor spread. those who, when you're hugging them, you're thinking, Ya Allah, this is a test of all tests. That Muslim who doesn't use fragrance, perfume, deodorant even is a form of fragrance. Especially in the summer. Ya Rab, how some people sadly have not oh understood wow. <laughs> And nawafatu min al iman. Oh, yeah. Cleanliness oh, yeah. is a part of faith. Especially when you're playing Sa'ad Jum'ah and then the guy in front of you has the socks. And the socks, well, I, I, it's unbelievable how many mosques I've been to. When you go and do wudu, you think that you've, you've not entered a place to do wudu. You, you're actually going through an obstacle course of remaining alive. And you hear people spitting loudly and you hear people, you know, I don't want to go further than that. And then. When you're always putting wow. your head down in sujood yeah. in a mosque, cheesy sock smell everywhere. Yeah, yeah. And you're thinking, oh, Ya Allah, fragrance. can people not have new socks when they come, for example, new pair of socks when they come to pray? So what you have here is the idea that me not putting fragrance on. You know, there are still people in certain Muslim countries who believe that in the name of Arfan or in the name of how to become more spiritual, for example, may not change some of their clothing. For example, may look disheveled. And on the contrary, a Muslim should be someone presentable, a Definitely. role model in the society. Definitely. Now, we're not saying a person leaves their house and pours the whole bottle of perfume on their head. But what we are saying is that cleanliness is a part a of faith. Sorry? A few sprays. A few, a few sprays pubs. and more than enough. So you've got on the one hand that. Then secondly, the eating of meat, the Prophet Muhammad would say, I'd eat meat. But he'd also say, don't make your stomachs graveyard for animals. Thirdly, when it came to being married, the Prophet Muhammad would make it clear that don't go towards this direction, that monasticism or zuhud, rahbaniya, spirituality is going to come by you staying away from marriage. Some ladies, interestingly, were also affected by this and the question came to the Imams of Ahlul Bayt where a lady had asked the question that, can I stay away from marriage? Because you know, some sisters in the community do go through the stage. Yeah. They may have been hurt once in a marriage or they actually believe that they'll dedicate their life to God. So they'll go and study, for example, at an Islamic seminary, wherever in the world. Let's say in Iraq, Iran, Egypt, Morocco, wherever. They'll say, that's it, I'm not getting married. I want to dedicate my life to God. And the Imams of Ahl al-Bayt reply by saying, if staying away from marriage gets you closer to God, then Fatima al-Zahra would not have got married. Allah. But Fatima al-Zahra got married. And if a person finds that partner, so celibacy, and the idea that I'll stay away from marriage, just because one thing goes wrong, for example, or completely my whole life, that's prohibited in Islam. Al-Baqillani, a renowned Islamic theologian of the other schools in Islam says quite interestingly, I wonder about Christianity when they tell their men of God to stay away from marriage while God himself had a son. And that's an interesting thing. The, the priest says, I will not get married, not going to have kids. What is it? Wow. Now, as I said, celibacy in Islam, no, that is prohibited. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, now, why does this racial element uh, still exist uh, within Islamic communities? Because honestly, if we take Ahl Bayt as role models and the Prophet, as, role, as, as you just mentioned, um, this shouldn't still exist. I mean, this should have died centuries ago, no? I, I wouldn't say racism, racism just exists in the Muslim community. I think there's a return of racist elements around the world. Oh, yeah. Don't need to mention the countries that are involved, but there seems to be oh, extremism on a far right uh, platform yep. um, in Europe and in other parts of the world, in other continents. There is extremist right-wing racist elements that are growing, people who are proud to say that people of other colors are to be frowned upon, are to be looked down upon, are not worthy of being called human beings. And some of these people are occupying prominent positions. But let's not hide from the fact, you go to Hajj or you go to Umrah, and you could see racism in the Arabs until today, and you think that that was left behind in the seventh century. 
So that racism still exists. And it exists really because of, there's two ways to look at it. If I'm going to give benefits of the doubt, mm -hmm. and it's very difficult for me to, but if I'm going to give benefit of the doubt, some of these aren't racist. Rather than they haven't got you used to the meeting of other cultures, the interaction with other heritages. You see, we're lucky we've traveled. You've lived in Canada. You've traveled to Europe. You've traveled to the Middle East. I've traveled six continents in this world. God's blessed me. The Quran says, Siru fil ard, travel in the earth. Why? Because you'll get to have that mind of yours open up. Yeah. There are certain racists who think Islam is a country. Wow. Yeah, actually, I've heard that. There are certain yeah, racists who think Islam is a country. If you were to ask them to point on the globe where Islam, is. where Islam is, they'll actually try and look for a country called Islam. Even if you were to ask them to name you countries of the Middle East. There are certain racists who have got their statistics wrong, their facts wrong, the media has lied to them. And then there are some who are just blatantly arrogant. They believe that they are the chosen people of God. And this affects a number of religions. Yeah. Muslims being one of them. That when you believe you're the chosen people of God, then you believe that your city is the chosen city and that everybody else is lower than you. Would you believe that even when you look at, for example, Iraq, there were many Iraqis who didn't even know that there was a huge Shia community or population in India. Yeah. If you go, for example, you look at Lebanon, I guarantee you that if you were to ask some people in parts of Lebanon, which has some of the followers of Ahlul Bayt and a great heritage, if you were to ask them which country in the world, for example, after Iran, has the biggest population of the followers of Ahlul Bayt, they will not know it's about India. It's yeah. many, do many, for example, out there will never have interacted with people from a background of India or Pakistan, let alone there are many who've never met reverts. In Iran, there are people who believe that those of us who are raised in England or America, some of us don't even know how to pray, some of us, our knowledge is not that strong, some can't even believe some of us are religious who are followers of Ahlul Bayt because narrow-minded, yeah. or because there's a lack of traveling. So when this racism still exists, a major reason is the lack of interaction with the other. Instead of interacting with others, sitting with others, learning from others, when you're only mixing with the same type of people, sometimes that racist element grows. Mm -hmm. Now, speaking of reverts, uh, just to touch on about a little bit, um, do you think reverts feel it more than anyone else? I think, um, I think reverts feel it more, and I think reverts also have to be careful that the complex of being oppressed all the time doesn't also affect them. So it works two ways. Mm -hmm. So you've got reverts out there who, someone's son may want to marry a revert sister, for example. And the parents are like, how can I trust this girl? How do I know she's not going to change her mind? How do, I, how do I know where her family is? Yeah. Instead of saying that this person, how much have they gone through to come towards the path of Ahlul Bayt? How much sacrifice? How many friends and family have they lost? How much bigotry and prejudice have they uh, been at the receiving end of from their family members who used to know them very well. No, how do I not know that they're a spy, for example? Maybe they're spying on you. Maybe they're this, this, that. The reaver also at the same time has to realize, like I said, that this demographic, many of them, only recently have interacted and mixed with others from the same school, let alone reverts. Wow. When our own parents have only recently mixed with others who are followers of Al Bayt but from different backgrounds, they have to be patient with that. There can be that revert complex, which is we're oppressed, no one looks after us, nobody this, this, and I don't deny that there have been moments where we have not shown the respect towards those who've sacrificed so much that they deserved. But sometimes it wasn't neglect of them. Rather, there was language barriers sometimes. Our parents' English may not have been as good as ours. So they would have wanted to interact but sad, sadly, that interaction ability was not there because of the language. Mm -hmm. So, yes, the reverts definitely have found it difficult. I knew one revert, 
from an African background, I think it took him 13 years proposing to different sisters in the community. Rejection, 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 because he was black African. And he ended up having to marry from his own country. Wow. Because the sisters in the community, their parents in many cases, and in some cases even the sisters, were looking and thinking, well, you know what, this person, different race, different color. But majority of the time it was the parents saying, we've never had a black person marry in our families. Hollywood sometimes has sketches on this, which make you laugh. You see some films where a white guy goes to propose for a, a black girl and, and the, fa the family are just interrogating him as, and you laugh when you watch it. And I think in the Muslim community, things are changing, but we have to be patient with the change. Mm -hmm. Now, a lot of people ask this question when it comes uh, to any issue that's out there. Has the Quran addressed this? How does the Quran seek to address interracial marriage? I mean, does it have any examples within uh, the Islamic literature about this? Well, the Quran, firstly, there are principal verses which seek to highlight that the only difference between human beings which brings them honor is their consciousness of God's presence in their life. Mm -hmm. If you look in chapter 49, verse 13 of the Holy Quran, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Ya ayyuha nas O mankind, Inna khalaqnaakum min dhakari wa untha, wa ja'alnaakum shu'uba wa qaba'ila li ta'arafu, Inna akramakum anda Allah yatqaakum. O mankind, we created you from male and female, from different races, and from different tribes in order that you get to know one another. I can't make this verse any clearer for the Lord of the heavens and the earth has made it so clear. Yeah. <laughs> tribes, races, <laughs> so that you get to know one another, not so that you find ways of not coming together. Get to know one another. Open up to each other. Learn about each other's heritage. Share each other's history. The human race has forgotten the bonds of brotherhood. The bonds of sisterhood. Sadly, when I look at Syria, Iraq, and I see the amount of bloodshed. You look at Yemen, bloodshed. You see parts of the world, not bloodshed, pedophilia, sexual abuse of children, begging. Us as human beings have to remember we all come from one origin. And God wanted to shatter the races in the Arab world by saying that the best amongst you is not the Arab. Just in case the Arabs are going to say, we are the ones who had the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, his family. And therefore, we're better than everybody else. No, not at all. The best amongst you in the eyes of God is the one who always puts God ahead of every other possible effector in any decision that he's going to make. Mm -hmm. So when you're looking at, for example, the Quran, God puts that verse to make it clear to everybody that taqwa is what differentiates you, not skin color. For years, how many people in America were flogged because they were black? How many had to live under harsh conditions because they were black? How many had to eat in different parts of a restaurant because they were black? Up until the late 60s. How many people who were natives were butchered? Yep. For years in parts of India and Africa, many were shot dead simply because an empire wanted to run its rule. For years in Vietnam, people saw oppression. For years in Iraq, people saw... All of this had a racist undertone, where we are better than those. Nazi Germany massacred millions simply because we are better than them. The only thing that differentiates us is our taqwa. In the Quran, it's interesting that you'll find that the prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala may marry from their own tribe, but a prophet of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala may also marry from outside. Nabi Ibrahim marries Hajar to shatter racism. Every Muslim, when they do the circumambulation of the Kaaba, the Tawaf, is honoring God's house, but is also honoring a black woman married to the father of 
the Abrahamic religions. Mm -hmm. He was originally married to Sarah. So you say same level. He marries Hajar, shattering this idea that because someone originally is from a slave background, they are not equal to me. On the contrary, the differentiator is taqwa. She has the consciousness of God's presence. I'll marry her. That example led to one of the most important moments in the history of religion. When she was ready to see her son sacrificed for God. That lady, no one looks at her as a black woman or a slave girl. But rather you look at her as a woman who taught us the meaning of sacrifice yes. and the love of God. Yes. So the Quran provided us with verses and also provided us with prophets who would shatter racism as much as they could. Mm -hmm. Now did Prophet Muhammad, I know we're talking about Prophet uh, Ibrahim, uh, but did Prophet Muhammad get married uh, to women of different races? Yes, yes the, the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon his family. The majority of his marriages were with women of an Arab background. But there was one marriage which is with a woman from the Copts of Egypt, Maria al uh -huh. Mary the Coptic. Yeah. Mary the Coptic, when the Prophet marries her, is a message and a lesson for all of us. Mm -hmm. Now don't say I'm not going to let my son marry someone from Africa when your prophet himself married someone from Africa. Mary the Coptic, the Holy Prophet, peace be upon his family, around that time, it's about five years before he passes away, five, four or five years before he passes away, the, he writes letters and of the people who he had who used to represent him in, in sending these letters to dignitaries, and you know, this brings up the debate, can he write, couldn't he write, did he write? You know, he has scribes who write for him. And Hatab bin Abi Balta'a was the one who had carried the letter to the Muqawqas of Egypt. You know, it's like, let's say, the high bishop or priest. Yeah. And while the priest doesn't necessarily accept Islam, he still reveres the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him. And the way that they would revere in those days, You'd send a donkey, you'd send a mule. You know, it's like a person today, for example, sending a form of transport as a gift. Okay, that's like the Lamborghini. The Lamborghini, Lamborghini. I, I, would I would say the, the, the stallions Lamborghini. and the horse, you know, the horses were more of Lamborghinis. Oh, these true. these yeah. were maybe a bit slower than that. Maybe you'd send someone a bike or a moped or something. And he sends these two, uh, two ladies and they are to be uh, presented as ladies who would be uh, gifts to the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, and his family. They'd work in his house and so on. And you found that Hatib does a very good job on the way back from Egypt in explaining Islam to them. Remember, it's not like Egypt Air or you know British Airways or, or you know Emirates is going to fly you from from Cairo to to Medina at the time. No, it was a quite a long journey, and he explains Islam to Maria mm -hmm. and he explains Islam to her sister Sirin. And they're, they're enamored and infatuated with the religion. And so when they come towards the Holy Prophet, peace be upon his family, they're not Christians, they've joined the religion now. And the Prophet ends up marrying Maria. Sirin, I think, gets married to Hassan bin Thabit or his son, is one of the two, it'll come back to me. So uh, she wasn't a slave. She, she, the Prophet actually got married to her. They got married to her. Because we have an narration saying she was a concubine, no? It's correct. correct. You know, some try and portray that she was a concubine because she's a gift from a king. Okay. But the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon his family, made it clear that, you know what, this person has converted to the religion of Islam mm -hmm. and is someone who he gets married to. And remember, when we go back to the Sira literature, I always say there's the Sira of Anas and others, and there's the seerah of Ahl al-Bayt and we'll stick to the seerah of the Ahl al-Bayt and I wouldn't be surprised, mind you, even within our own seerah literature, yeah. that there are things which are open to question, yeah. especially when you look at the principles of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and other traditions and so on. So, she originally is from the Copts of Egypt, who are still a very important community in Egyptian society. So, unlike Khadija, for example, or unlike for example, Zainab, who is his cousin. What about Safiya? There was narrations that she was a Jew? 
Yes, yes well, well that, that you're going now to interreligious marriages and this person has converted to the religion of Islam. Okay. So the same. She, she is, is mocked Muslim. because she was originally Jewish. Um, and the Prophet says, well, you're then originally from the people of Moses and Harun. What's wrong with that? What's wrong with but that? But this is interracial. This is someone now from a different background altogether in terms of race. She's from Africa, the Prophet Muhammad from Arabia. But he marries and he makes it clear, an example for all of us today. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now, the, a lot of people ask this, when did she die exactly? Um, and why is her grave unknown or blocked uh, today? Well, she, she died, died in the 16th year after Hijrah. Five years after the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, his family uh, passed away. What remains in her honor is a watering well in Medina. You know, in Medina, when you go for Umrah or Hajj, you go to the group of the lovers of Ahlul Bayt in Medina, mm -hmm. the Imam Al Hassan Center or Mosque, if I'm not mistaken, is where many of them gather and. You have this area, which is the watering well of Mary the Coptic. As well, you have the area next to it, which is where Imam al radas mother is buried. And that was uh, a piece of land the Prophet had designated for her. Now, the Saudi government had ordered that it's blocked off because there were many people who would go there to try and honor the memory of one of the wives of Rasulullah. That's the wife of Rasulullah. Well, in some countries, I suppose there are certain wives who will get a bit more honor than others. <laughs> wow, okay. Um, Sayyidina, we'll go to a short break uh, before this escalates, and we'll be back very uh, shortly. Respective viewers, do stay tuned for we'll be back very shortly, but after this short break. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Dear viewers, thank you for joining us on the Imam Hussein TV network. It's an honor to be back in the holy city of Karbala after a period of two years. Ah. And we'll be coming to you live every night with the ah. exception of Friday at 9.30, according to Karbala timing, to bring to you the new show, Back to the Basics. Several theological, jurisprudential, ethical, and numerous other contentions raised by the non-Shia and our protagonists in our day-to-day -day lives. And we hope, inshallah ta'ala, to be laying out a sustainable framework for how to engage with such things. Thank you so much. And I pray that you can join us all live every night here from the holy city of Karbala. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. Hope you, inshallah, uh, enjoyed uh, that report. Now we are back live from the holy city uh, of Karbala with a very special guest. Dr. Sayyid Amar Naqshwani, how you say now? Welcome back. Thank you. Now, before the break, Sayyid, now we talked about some of the issues uh, that people have uh, regarding uh, interracial marriages, and you cleared it out. I mean, th there's nothing, there's absolutely nothing wrong with marrying someone from a different race. It goes, all goes back to the ego of the parents, and you know, that race isn't good enough for us, uh, and such uh, things you mentioned, or some points uh, you mentioned. Uh, earlier on. Now, what was it like for people like Bilal uh, during early Islam? I mean, a black slave of Prophet Muhammad uh, bought him um, and I rescued him. I don't think it was easy at all. And I think anyone who's finding it difficult, you know, from, for example, the revert community yeah. to get married only has to look at him as an example. You know, uh, this is a man who the Arabs who had become Muslim, yeah. their racism would still exist when he was designated as the man to recite the Adhan. Because as we know, he could not say his sheen, he would say seen. Yeah. And so when he'd go up to recite Adhan, people would hear him say, Ashadu an la ilaha illallah, Ashadu anna Muhammadan Rasulullah. And, and when people would hear this, people would say, Muhammad's black crow can't even say the sheen properly. And then, of course, the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, and his family gives a devastating reply that the sheen of, that the scene of Bilal is sheen in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Mm -hmm. Now, Bilal is not the only one who found that racist element was existing. There's a famous narration, Salman, who is known as Salman the Persian. Imam yeah. al-Sadiq says, don't call him Salman al-Farisi, call him Salman al-Muhammadi, for he is one of us, the Ahl al-Bayt. Mm -hmm. But some people still call him Salman al-Farisi has interaction with Umar ibn al-Khattab, where Umar ibn al-Khattab tries to 
mock him by saying that I'm from this tribe and this person's from this tribe, where are you from? Yeah. And you know, Salman gives again a, a wonderful reply, which only someone of Salman's level of Iman can reply, where he makes it clear that I was lost and I found Allah through Muhammad. Allah. You know, that's where I am. And the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, his family, quite wonderfully uh, makes it clear that Salman is from us, the Ahlul Bayt. Mm -hmm. But Salman and Bilal, amongst others, one was Persian, one was African. The racist Arabs still, it existed amongst them. This tendency to look down at the non-Arab. If you look later, for example, in the period of the Caliphate, Arabs and non-Arabs were even differentiated when it comes to the treasury and the expenditure economically, yeah. which was shared amongst the people. Non-Arabs do start entering large cities like Kufa only, you know, 10 years after the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon his family, has died. They are known as Mawali, Persians, and so on. Um, Yemeni is, well, of an Arab background, but now have come towards Kufan society. Um, th these Persians who have come and others are still frowned upon but start to amalgamate. But Bilal, as I said, really faces a difficult time. Some mention that he marries Abdul Rahman bin Auf's sister, whereas others say that no, he had to wait until he left Medina, went to live in Syria, ends up marrying a lady by the name of Hind. So, it, and even when it comes to you know, children of Bilal, there's some sort of uncertainty. Did he have children? Didn't he have children? <laughs> yeah, so even some will say, some of the historians reach a conclusion that there was so much racism amongst the Arabs still that even then there was a difficulty for him. Now, so, you know, we hear in, in, in many stories um, that the Prophet tried to bring men and women together who couldn't get married, tried to bring them together, but we, why didn't he try with Bilal? I mean, couldn't he tell someone to marry Bilal? Oh. Well, I think the Holy the Prophet, peace be upon his family, definitely is one who seeks to match, make, and recommend. Yeah. But at the same time, I think, you know, you don't want to force a girl into marrying uh, someone who they may not want to. Or Good point. you could send a proposal, but it doesn't mean that people will accept. There's a famous yeah. story of um, Juwaybar, the black um, slave originally, who the Prophet tells to go and propose for the daughter of Ziyad yeah. uh, bin Lubayd or bin Labid. And, and when Juwaybar goes for the... Uh, for the proposal, before he goes, he tells the Holy Prophet, peace be upon his family, that you know they're never going to accept me. I'm black. Yeah. I'm, you know, I'm not the best-looking guy on earth. And the Prophet says, "Don't worry, I'll help you." And sometimes we need a few more helpers when it comes to interracial marriages. Yeah. And so what happens is, the Prophet, peace be upon his family, tells him, "Listen, go there and say I'm the one yeah. who's recommending. What better reference do you want so in humanity than?" the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him and his family. Mm -hmm. Now when, when, Bil when uh, Joiba reaches Ziyad's place, Salaam alaikum alaykum wa how you doing? Formalities. So he's like, what are you doing here? And he's like, well, I've come with a proposal from the Holy Prophet, peace be upon his family. He goes, well, we welcome any proposal. Who's proposing? Is that me? Is that sorry? Uh, me. He's like, but you know, you're black and we're Arab and you know, He's like, oh, okay, I'm sorry. Then as he's leaving, Ziyad says, wait, wait. He says to him, you've come on behalf of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon his family. I cannot rudely just make you go like that. Let me go and meet the Prophet Muhammad. And so when he meets the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon his family, the Prophet, peace be upon his family, tells him, what's the issue? And he's like, well, you know, we're Arab and like, he's, you know, that he's what? What is he? He's black. He's black and... And the Prophet says, you know, the Prophet replies to him, making it clear to him, we're all children of Adam. What differentiates us is our taqwa. We remove this racism. And so he comes back and he tells him, that if my daughter accepts, yes. then who am I to stop? So what you have is the Prophet will try and help. Yeah. But there were still people with those racist tendencies. You don't want to force Can't something force to happen and then have that, Definitely. you know, that tension that exists. Um, now, we, we seem to see the Ahl Bayt uh, marrying predominantly from Africa and to reverts, um, just to mention, not only from Africa, but, only, but also reverts. Now, why is that? Why, why not? I mean, Arabs and you're close to them and you know, why go to, to, to Africa, especially reverts? 
You're, you're very true. right in saying that, you know, I would say half of the Imams of Ahlul Bayt, half of the 12 Imams marry ladies of African descent. If you're looking, for example, Imam Al Sadiq, Imam Al Kadhim, Imam Al Rabah, Imam Al Jawad, Imam Al Hadi, Imam Al Askar, Imam Al Salam, mm -hmm. and even the mother of the 12th, all of them are from an African background. I think there's a number of reasons. One of them is to, again, destroy the racism. You know, an Imam of Ahlul Bayt is from Medina. He can marry a girl from Medina. Uh, you know, someone who's a, a relative of his from Medina, yeah. someone who's from the line of um, Fatima Zahra alayhi salam, you know, from the grandchildren, say, of Imam al Hassan and so on. You know, you can marry someone who's a Sayyid and so on, but they marry, firstly, to shatter that racism. Secondly, there is a beauty in now when you're marrying someone from another background, there's an alliance to be formed. You've taken their daughter, they're going to be having your back. Those alliances, those political alliances are important. Number three, you share your heritage. Yeah. They have expertise in that field. You have expertise in this field. They have expertise in field X. You have expertise in field Y. And I think that was the reasons behind it. But these ladies, don't get it wrong. These ladies weren't just ladies who they just married and gave birth to an imam. If you look at Imam al-Sadiq's wife, Hamid al-Barbariya, a phenomenal personality. One of the scholars of the school of Ahlul Bayt You look at, for example, Imam al-Hadi's wife, yeah, by the name of Hudayth, yes. or some traditions mention Salil, phenomenal personality. You look at Imam al-Kadhim's um, wife, a lady who's seen as one of the mystics in the school of Ahlul Bayt, a lady of immense spirituality. Now, when I'm going to instill this spirituality and this knowledge in her as an Imam does, that has an effect on the whole of that city, the whole of her descendants yeah, and yeah. so on. So anyone out there whose son has come and said, I want to marry a girl from a different background, different race, and the parents turn around and say, well, you know what? We don't allow this. It's not part of our culture. We only marry from our village or we only marry from our city or we only marry from our country. They certainly aren't following the principles of the Imams of Ahlul Bayt. Mm -hmm. now, this marriage would result uh, the children turning out to be brown uh, or black in, in some cases, uh, you know, light skin uh, as we call them now. I mean, uh, what, how, how, how did the Arabs react to this? I mean, they couldn't even stand the Imams. Some couldn't even stand the Imams being the Imams themselves as Arabs. But now they're making off to, to Africans and their children being mixed Africans now. So everything is t tending to be a bit more closer. How did the Arabs react to this? Well, I think some didn't take it lightly at all. I think with Imam al-Jawad alayhi salam, Imam al-Jawad had a tough time because some of his Shia were even questioning why he had a darker yeah. complexion than others. Um, and it's sad when we reach that stage because the Holy Prophet, peace be upon his family, says whoever has a seed of this racism yeah. will be raised with the Arabs of the Jahiliyyah on the Day of Judgment. Wow. Just a seed. And I think when you look at Imam al-Jawad especially, where some would say that a certain part of modern day Sudan is where his mother was from. Oh, wow. You'll find that even Imam al-Hadi's wife, for example, is from the southern side of Egypt. And so these Imams, as you're leading up to the 12th of Al Muhammad, Salawatullah wa salamu alayhim, you'll see that these Imams are definitely of a complexion that is not what's recognized in some of the pictures we see in Karbala or Najaf. When I walk in Karbala or Najaf, you have some of these pictures which try and display the Imams. Of course, these things are not recommended in the school of Ahlul Bayt. But we give the benefit of the doubt as a historical depiction, certainly nothing to be believed in. And if you look at them, I think those pictures are more what a person wants the Imams to look like, yeah. rather than historically what the Imams would have looked like. Yeah. And it's a shame if someone says, well, I will not respect the Imams of Ahlul Bayt if they are of a certain color or of a certain complexion. Yeah. I mean, and even now when we see uh, pictures of, you know, d different saints and stuff being colored black just to be closer uh, to that community. Uh, but say that we have also a question. My phone always almost fell when I was asking the question. Uh, but we have a question. Um, what would you advise someone? Uh, Iraqi guy wants to marry a Pakistani girl, but their parents are anti this relationship. What's your advice to that? Well, when the parents are anti the relationship, I think first and foremost, never change your akhlaq with your parents. Always maintain good akhlaq. Yeah. 
Secondly, try and look for someone who has a good word or a man of wisdom who can affect your parents. There's always a, maybe a scholar they respect, maybe a family member they respect, who when they speak to them, they'll take their word, not with a pinch of salt, but with a real seriousness. And I think it's fundamental that a person is patient on that front. Don't think that your parents don't want your happiness, but sometimes they're just not used to mingling with others or they just don't know how to interact with them. Yeah. If you can be patient and you can also at the same time, don't forget acts of supplication, acts of prayer. Sometimes we forget these things. Yeah. Sometimes you pray to Allah, Ya Allah, rotate the hearts of my parents. God is muqallib al qulub Sometimes if your parents heart is not willing to give in, don't give up. But if both of you are muttaqeen, then be patient, inshallah, God will open the doors for you. Now, what if their parents say no? I mean, no for uh, Sharia reasons, they can't. Uh, the then you're in trouble. <laughs> then you're in trouble because if your parents are saying no, then you're in trouble. Uh, because to get through your parents' head when they're adamant in saying no, this is not happening, joking aside, I would say, if, is it for Sharia reasons or non-Sharia reasons? Yeah. If it's for non-Sharia reasons, like saying, well, we don't like him because he has brown shoes on, that's not a reason. If it's for Sharia reasons where they say, for example, this person is known to be of those who may take certain substances they shouldn't, may drink certain things they shouldn't, then respect your parents' wisdom. Oh, However, it's non-Sharia reasons, of course, in Islam, Parents, if they don't allow you to get married for non sharia reasons, fickle reasons, you can disobey them. You can disobey your parents. I wouldn't say that's the first resort. The first resort is having good akhlaq with your parents, being patient with your parents. No, and also something, just before, yeah. also something, you know, sometimes you'll find that there are sisters in the community, they might want to get married to a brother and the, and the brother's like, you know, be patient. The sister's like, you know what, if you don't give me an answer in a week, that's it. No, no. Calm down, if it's meant to be, it'll happen. Wow. There are some brothers who get too emotional, start texting back a hundred times, please listen to me, please be patient. No, play it cool. If the sister's trying to tell you, you know what, I want an answer, if you don't give me an answer, it gets all emotional on you, you start getting a having a headache, don't have a headache. Turn around and say, you know what, let's wait, be patient. If it's meant to be, it's gonna be. Because sometimes we make the situations bigger than what they are. Yeah, that's, that's actually true. true. That's true. There so are many true. guys out there, but they're not real men. Yeah. Masculinity and chivalry has very much disappeared. They get to know someone, and you know, ladies also know how to play with the emotion of the man. Oh yeah. And so what happens is that the lady might turn around to him and say, you know what, if your parents aren't giving me an answer, that's it, don't contact me again. Okay. If it's not meant to be, it's not meant to be. Yeah. They get baffled. What's this reverse psychology? What's going on here? I thought he's going to get unhappy and text me a million times. I won't answer him for until eight weeks later. No, you don't need to go through that stage. Sit back, have trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Done. It's sad when your parents reject someone because they don't like the look of him. They don't like the skin color. And you can disobey. Now, say that. I want to come back to that. Disobeying what? I mean, you have to be specific because now you can have girls running around with, with guys and guys running around with girls because of Sayyid Ammar saying you can disobey. I mean, as I, as I said, we're not talking about relationships where, oh, I just want to go out with someone. You want to marry someone, they're a follower of Ahlul Bayt, you're a follower of Ahlul Bayt. You go to your parents, he goes to his parents. You talk, the parents can talk. If the parents haven't even started talking and your parents are adamant, we had mentioned about 10 minutes earlier, yeah. be patient. No need to do anything drastic. Okay. You be patient, you wait for the right person, a scholar of the community, someone of wisdom to go and speak to the parents. If after all of this, you know, there are some cases which have taken two and a half, three, four years. I remember one case where the father of the girl said, if Imam Mahdi came and told me. Yeah, we, we hear that a lot. You know, yeah, Iraqis, yeah, yeah. if they lose their fuse, even if the Prophet, if the Allah Prophet, says, if Imam Mahdi, you know, if someone comes and tells me right now that you, I will not listen. That person, be patient with them. He needs to calm down. Calm down. down. So I'm not saying that a person, oh, just because my dad doesn't want this, I'm going to run away and elope and whatever. No. We're saying that technically in Islamic law, 
The reason is a religious reason. It cannot be a reason which is a fickle, non shari reason. Mm -hmm. Technically. Mm -hmm. It is an akhlaqi way to do it. Yeah, and I, I, I believe in, in Surah Al-Isra or Surah Al-Kahf. One of them, it says, وَخْفِذْ لَهُمَا جَنَاحَ I mean, be... Yeah, lower the wings, lower the wings of mercy. to your parents yes. and all that. Where does this come into play? Well, your parents, you know, when, as they get older, you'll find sometimes there might be a bit of impatience on certain things. So I think it's vital that a person lowers their wings of mercy. Yeah, so and not start saying words like Uffin and you know what, I don't want to chat to you anymore. Yeah. And don't be rude towards them as well. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, now, uh, Sayyidina, what do you advise uh, what, uh, the converts who can get married uh, to born Muslim women, Muslim born uh, women? What's your advice to them? Who really, as we mentioned earlier, they can't get through to the parents, to the parents' head, the ego is too high. How you advise those? It's a testing time, it really is. But I think also if we're going to be realistic on certain issues, mm -hmm. if a father-in-law from now is telling you, I don't respect you, you should get the hint sometimes as well. Oh, yeah. Some may persevere out of love for the daughter. Others should get a hint that if this man hasn't respected my sacrifices, or they haven't respected my knowledge, then that should be the hint that this person may never ever respect me. I'm not going to say that it didn't change. There are many who married reverts. And years later, the change occurred. From both sides. Listen, sometimes you marry a revert and her parents are the problem. Say, we don't want you. Yeah. So from both sides, things do change later on. But also sometimes a person should get the hint that some families may never change. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now we also have traditions that say, don't marry the Zinj and the Kurds. Now the Zinj, if you want to translate it, it would be the black and then the Kurds being well the Kurds now what are the traditions we don't want Zenj, to get into Zenj, yes there is traditions that mention I even you know the traditions can be seen even Al-Kafi there's a narration within Sahih Sajjadiyah there's a dua in relation to the people of the Zenj and so on Zenj if you look at part of East Africa called Zanjabar mm -hmm. or Zanzibar yeah. yeah Zenj is not to be translated as some translated the black mm -hmm. no that part were a group of people who were intoxicated in idol worship. And in Islam, you cannot marry those who worship idols. So you're not saying do not marry the black as some have wrongly thought of the word zenj. Mm -hmm. Rather, that's related to, for example, those people who were indulging in that part of East Africa, in Zanzibar, mm -hmm. were indulging in idol worship. Or sometimes, if it's mentioning other races, those races may have been involved in black magic, in jinn. Those people, naturally, you don't want to get married to. You know, if you're going to propose for someone and she's like, you know, my hobby is to talk to jinn, you can, you know, you're, already, you're already going to look at her at certain times, thinking, have I woken up next to a jinn, let alone if she's interacting with jinn. And, and I think um, those traditions sometimes are thrown out to say that the Shia, is, you know, they are racist, their imams say don't marry from the Zenj and the Kurd, no, yeah. on the contrary. This is about a particular group of people because of their behaviors and their ideologies. Mm -hmm. Now, say that Islamically speaking, uh, what would you place as a criteria uh, for marriage, a foundation for marriage? Looks, 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 looks. no, only joking. In terms of the criteria, looks is yeah, definitely, yeah, well, okay, I, I suppose, all right, 99% looks, okay, and then we'll find space for um, akhlaq and for uh, you know, taqwa somewhere else oh, wow. as well. Naturally, the looks are important. I know sometimes people in my field will well, say, someone beautiful saying that. Well, you know, beauty is in the eye of the beholder. Yeah. Um, beauty fades. You know, people grow. Typical stuff. And I think while these things are fundamental to yeah. think about, you have to be attracted to the person you're with. Definitely. Well, if that person you're attracted to has no akhlaq, then you can't wait to run away. Oh, yeah. And so I think akhlaq is fundamental. You know, the moral principles is the foundation of this religion. When the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, and his family said, I have been sent with one mission, with the usage of the word innama highlighting, the sole mission is what? The perfection of that which has come before me, and that is, the perfection of the message of sublime morals. A community with akhlaq is alive. Mm -hmm. 
when their akhlaq goes, the community dies. And in marriage, one of the most fundamental things is the humility, the forbearance, the dignity, the patience, the respect. And that is a fundamental criteria. Mm -hmm. And then that in itself should bring about a religious person. Notice, I didn't necessarily put religion, you know, taqwa ahead of akhlaq because there are those who claim to have taqwa. No, but no. maybe the type of person, judgmental, always trying to make rumors about someone's yeah. life, hating on people, oh, yeah. cannot take their success or their fame. Yet they're seen as being religious. So akhlaq definitely, and that should bring about the criteria of taqwa mm -hmm. all as a package. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, earlier, earlier Sayyidina, you mentioned, you mentioned that one of the uh, Imams of Ahl Bayt uh, which uh, we're remembering uh, tonight, Imam Al-Askari also married from an African descent. Um, now, can you talk about that? His mother, his mother, his mother, his mother Hudayf, and if you were to look, for example, at his wife, Narjis, as some will call mm -hmm. her, his mother came from the south of Egypt the Nobans. There's mm -hmm. a tradition of the Holy Prophet, peace be upon his family. If you don't have any friends, then take a friend from the Nobans, the south of Egypt. And this lady was a colossal personality, really was. So his mother is from the south of Egypt and his wife, you know, from Byzantine, African and, and that region. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, now, Imam al-Hadi uh, was approving this idea of interracial uh, marriage. I mean, this also brought confusion uh, and conflict within the Arabs as well because you know, by that time Imam al Sadiq had married um, you know Imam al Sadiq had married uh, from North Africa and Imam al Kadhim and Imam al Rada and Imam al Jawad all of them had married from North Africa so by that time it was a bit easy on Imam al Hadi alayhi salam but yeah at that time there were Arabs who would not marry except from their village and the Imams were slowly trying to destroy this by saying that there are women not of your village, women who are not granddaughters of Rasulullah, but are wonderful personalities. Yeah. Uh, now, how significant uh, was uh, Hudayth, as you mentioned yeah. earlier, uh, Hudayth in the protection of Imam al Mahdi? Uh, may Allah his your parents. Hudayth plays a fundamental role, the mother of Imam al Askari, the wife of Imam al Hadi in protecting Imam al-Mahdi in the first five years of his life. Yes. You know, in Shi'i thought, mm -hmm. we are of the belief that Imam al-Mahdi, Ajalallah Farajah al-Sharif, went into the minor occultation yes. at the age of five. The question arises, if the Abbasids were surrounding the house of Imam al-Askari exactly. for yeah. the first five years, Imam al-Mahdi hasn't gone into a minor occultation. Yeah. How come they didn't support the kid? That's because Imam al-Askari sent the baby Imam al-Hadi, the young child Imam al-Hadi, to go and live with his grandmother in Medina. And some narrations would mention if you wanted to see him, of the followers of Ahlul Bayt, you could see the young child in Mecca during the period of Hajj. Many of the followers of Ahlul Bayt do not know that Imam al-Mahdi, for the first few years of his life, did not grow up in Samarra, he grew up in Medina. If he grows up in Samarra, they're going to kill him. Because he hasn't gone into Ghaiba yet. He goes into Ghaiba at the age of five. Samarra. The age of five. Age Before of five. the age of five, the question arises, uh -huh. he can't be living in Samarra because they would have killed him. So where's he living? Medina. With his grandmother Hudayf. So the first role of Hudayf, mother of Imam al-Askari, wife of Imam al-Hadi, African lady, is that she protects the Imam in the most dangerous circumstances. Mm -hmm. The second role is she is the one who executes the will of Imam al-Askari Normally, let's say you get your son to execute your will. Yeah? yeah? Yeah. You can't do it in this case. You're not going to write Muhammad al-Hadi. Uh, Muhammad al-Mahdi, by the way, guys, you Abbasids, have a look. Here's his name. Like Imam al-Sadiq, they said that they'll kill whoever he's written as his inheritor. Yeah. And he put five names down. The person who's meant to kill the person. His name's there. Mansour the Khalifa's name, Hamida the wife and so on. Likewise, Imam al-Askari puts that Hudayf, his mom, is the one who executes his will. So she plays a fundamental role. 
in the protection of Imam al-Mahdi. Uh, now, Sayyidina, uh, we moving on to the questions uh, we're receiving <coughs> on uh, Facebook uh, and uh, on the messages uh, as well. Now, uh, Ghulam Abbas is asking, what is the best way to guide someone who is about to leave Islam, who is leaving Islam? Well, entertain all their questions. But let the person answering the questions be someone of knowledge and not your uncle who thinks he's knowledgeable. Mm -hmm. We always have a member of our family who thinks he's the most knowledgeable and he's giving just nonsense in his answers. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it's vital that someone's about to leave Islam. Listen, there's no harm. You don't want to choose Islam as your religion. It's completely up to you. But at least sit with the, pers the people of knowledge and wisdom mm -hmm. who you should give a try in allowing them to explain those things you may have certain differences or misconceptions on. Mm -hmm. Make sure that when someone is uncertain about the principles of Islam, don't say to them you can't question. They can question. They can be skeptics. Because sometimes skepticism leads to certainty one day. I'd prefer someone who asks and asks rather than someone who just blindly follows a religion because of their mom and dad yeah. in the Quran. Many times the Holy Prophet, peace be upon his family, you hear the ayah begins, Yes alunaka, yes alunaka, yes alunaka, yes alunaka an al ahilla, yes alunaka an al hasab, yes alunaka an al qarnain, yes alunaka an al ruh. Many times people would be asking the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon his family, questions. Yeah. Tell us about the spirit. Tell us about Dhul Qarnain. Tell us about the day of judgment. Tell us about the moon. Tell us. Why would the Quran begin many ayahs? Yes, alunaka, yes, alunaka, yes, alunaka. To show that the Prophet Muhammad, if his religion, peace be upon him, is a religion of God, it should be open to people's questions. If you follow a religion or a sect that tells you don't ask questions, then you should begin to question the structure of that sect or religion that you follow. Mm -hmm. um, now, Nancy uh, from the U.S., she's saying, um, I'm trying to get married to someone, uh, but my parents are not allowing me to, al allowing me to because he has tattoos uh, all over his body. And um, what's your advice to my parents? Should, well, should we show them your most tattoos? Of the, most, most of the coolest guys have got tattoos, and most of the most judgmental people sit in the front lines of mosques and churches. So I wouldn't necessarily oh, look at a person's tats and say that that person's one to worry about. I'd rather look at, you know, some of those who sit in the mosques. Some of those can be the most judgmental. I'd always be wary of the holier than thou. Yeah. You killed her right there. Uh, now, uh, there's also, uh, regarding the lecture you uh, gave, uh, to the Sayyid and non-Sayyid uh, lecture that you gave, they're saying, um, how will this break, this uh, racial, is this considered as racial boundaries as well, uh, when uh, a Sayyid cannot marry, uh, sorry, sorry, a non-Sayyid cannot marry a Sayyid woman? Yeah, this is only an issue in India and Pakistan, nowhere else. Mm -hmm. It's nowhere else. It's never been an issue for our scholars never been an issue for our Imams, never been an issue for our Prophets. Mm -hmm. And there are those people out there who say that unless this happens, how are we going to preserve the legacy of the Prophet, peace be upon his family and the heritage? Don't worry, God will do that for you. Mm -hmm. And He'll preserve the heritage and He'll preserve when He said, إِنَّا أَعْطَيْنَاكَ الْكَوْثَرِ There'll be an abundance will continue to grow. Look for the taqwa of the person, that should be more than enough of a criteria. Um, and hopefully, you know, such beliefs which are not part of the school of Ahlul Bayt, hopefully there'll be a day where people are able to learn and understand them. Inshallah. But then again, you could repeat this a million times. The one out there who can't write his name in Arabic will end up being the one who will tell you what all of the traditions mean. Yeah. That's funny. Yeah. Uh, well, Sayyidina, thank you very much for joining thank us you. tonight. Thank you. Pleasure. It was uh, a, a very nice topic as we were getting many compliments uh, saying that 
the answers were fulfilled. Uh, Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen, thank you very much for joining us tonight. Hopefully we can have you uh, in the near future. Once again, thank you. Respective viewers, thank you very much for joining us tonight. Hopefully we can, you know, join hands in hands because we do live in a multicultural society uh, where everyone, the, the Paks, the Iraqis, the Lebanese, everyone's living close. Let's break this racial boundaries and follow in the real footsteps of the Ahlul Bayt. Thank you very much once again. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.